Is this, okay, this is working. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, TJ and I did not coordinate. It just was a uh, happenstance. Um, but uh, as he said, uh, before I get into this, I would um, like to pray one more time, and then we will get into our message for today. Uh, Father God, we thank you that we were able to uh, come together, Lord. Um, Lord, I pray today, Father God, that your presence remained in this place, Father God. I pray that what is about to be said, Father, uh, edifies, glorifies, and encourages, Father God. I pray that I would decrease, Father God, and that you would increase, Lord. I pray that you would be in here, Father God, that your spirit would be in here, Father God, with love and conviction, Father God. Uh, this is my prayer in your mighty son, Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Um, so as TJ I told you, uh, um, we're speaking about what God hates. And I know normally when I'm up here, I do like to have a good time when discussing uh, the word of God. But he kind of uh, level set us last week um, with his tone and the way he chose to speak about this particular subject. I know here at Cross Church, we're normally a church of love and feel good and encouragement. And while there is a place for that, I also believe and I was... Uh, God spoke to me and said, there's also a time where we are to take certain things seriously. Um, so I'm not saying I'm going to be uh, harsh or relentless in this, but my assignment for today was to communicate to you what he communicated to me in the tone he chose me to communicate it in. And I want to assure everyone that it is all in love. And sometimes we need that tough love to give us the push we need to make the transformation necessary so that we can be the people that God has called us to be. Yes. And so um, uh, the sin I was given to cover today uh, was pride. And I did a, a, I did a bit of reading on the subject throughout this week. One of the interesting things about my preparation for this sermon was that normally uh, when it comes to other subjects, I scour the internet for uh, facts, data, statistics, whatever you want to call it, to um, see what other people have said about, you know, a particular subject. But I felt God lead me into, he said, this time you will just read the scripture and I will minister to you. I will inform you of what it is that needs to be said and how to communicate it. So this was a major, uh, hum I guess, a, a humble exercise for me to not try to trust myself in this process. And so um, the scripture we're going to go for, we're going to be reading from is Luke 18, verse 9 through 14. It may be a um, familiar one, and I'm not quite sure what version uh, I, I gave, but this is the one I'll be reading from. And I just want to let you guys know we are going to go back through this text uh, to analyze uh, a few things that God had pointed out to me as we go through uh, pride today. And um, I guess I should give you guys some time to, to get to that uh, scripture before I rush ahead. I don't want to assume that everyone's got it. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and start reading. Um, and it says this. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer, I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, and adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, were turned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And so today we're going to be discussing, I guess, the grime and the grit that is pride, and I firmly believe, as do other scholars, that pride is the root sin of all other sins. If we can nick this one, then the others will fall off. But 
I would, it would be unfair of me to give you what I believe is a definition of what pride is, because I feel like we have a general idea of it. We think we may know or, you know, we've convinced ourselves that it, is, it may be this one thing when it, in, when it is, in fact, could be another. And what I have written here, what God gave me, is pride is the assertion of one's own values, ideals, and convictions over that of the will, word, and heart of God. And when reading this, I really kind of had to redefine what pride meant for me. As I said this week, I had to relearn a lot because I was so convinced that I knew something. And, you know, that was a great way to not start the week off, you know, (laughs) convinced that I knew something. And so in the humbling of that, God took me back through and said, we're going to relearn what you thought you knew strap up. I was like, all right. And so I have, what is pride and what makes it so dangerous? So we're going to go back through the text because I had to, when I tell you guys, I had to reread this, the scripture that uh, states, I meditated on your word day and night. I would, I read over this so many times because I felt like that's what he had asked me to do. And every time he revealed something new to me. We're going to focus, the first half we're going to focus on the Pharisee, the second half we'll focus on the tax collector. And at no point am I going to ask you to identify yourself with any one of these two. I just want everyone to just let the Holy Spirit, just, 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 let's just listen to what God has to say. It says, two men went to the temple to pray. Two men went to church to seek God. One was a Pharisee, the other was a despised tax collector. To give context, because I didn't know what a Pharisee was, a Pharisee is basically a religious leader. I want to call it legalism, um, is the word that I have. And then we have a despised tax collector, the IRS. (laughs) So we've got a church regulator and the IRS are both going to church to seek God. And it's funny that it says right here, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. In other contexts, it says that he pretty much went to the front of the church. He went to the very front of the church and prayed this prayer. And then in other versions, it says he prayed this to himself. And I don't know if I've mentioned it up here before, but I was taught early on that God... turn it off. No, you're good. <laughs> Are we, do you want me to just, I can just change to a mic. It's, okay. Boy, the, the devil really don't want you to get this today. <laughs> he is the, he's determined. He said, I'm going to stop this message. He's like, I like my people in pride. He's like, I like you guys engaged with pride. You good? Oh, okay. Okay. And so, yeah, in some context, it states here that the Pharisee stood to himself and prayed. And as I was saying, it's like, I'm a sucker for language. I was taught early on that God is very intentional about the words he uses. So when it says the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, at no point did he even really seem to address God on the first half. I found that interesting. And it says, I thank you, God, that I am not like other people. Cheaters. Uh, Some versions call it uh, extortionists, basically manipulators. The second one, he says, I am not a sinner. So you can imagine the boldness that we're, the course we're already going, the fact that he just said, I am not a cheater, nor am I a sinner. The third one, I am not an adulterer. I don't mess with people who are not in covenant with me. And I am certainly not like the tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. And as I read this, I realized he addressed everything he wasn't. None of what he was. And he focused on all that he did, the things that he did to appear right before the Lord. But at no point did he ever talk about what was in his heart. And so that's where we get into the dangers of pride because pride is a danger. 
just like any other sin. But for whatever reason, pride seems to be the one on the list that puts you in direct opposition with God. Um, And I don't know about you. I've been in opposition with God. And the best way I can describe it is like the little leagues challenging the big leagues. Uh, T-ball versus professional baseball. And at no point in anywhere in my life will I be ever able to get on the field with God and contend. It'd be like a grain of rice against, well, you know how small a grain of rice is, just anything bigger than that. <laughs> and so what I, what I was re- as I was reading through this, what, it to- what, what Lord told me, what the Lord had told me is that one danger of pride is that pride is unaware. Definition for unaware is having no knowledge of a situation or fact. And so while the Pharisees going on and on about what he's not, it seems that he would be unaware of what he is. And not being aware of what you are can be a very dangerous place to be. Uh, I was talking this over with myself this morning. You know, sometimes it's not the sins that we confess are the ones that are necessarily killing us. They do play a part in that, but it's the ones that we are aware of and the ones we are unable to, not unable, unwilling to change that get us into deep trouble. Uh, And for example, those of us who can admit that we have a temper and we laugh it off. Oh, you know me and my temper. You know how I am. It's like that's when you've gotten to a passive point in dealing with the things that God has asked you to correct. And that is nothing short of pride. And I want to uh, just lay this out there. Uh, the, The difficult part about speaking about this subject is that, you know, as I said, I went through it this week, is that I'm going to try to communicate this in a way that um, is, I don't want to say inoffensive because it may rub anyone the wrong way, but I am aware of the fragility of the human ego. And I want to communicate this in a way that we are able to receive what God has for us so that we can make the transformation to be who he has called us to be. But at the same time, I believe he told me not to coddle or soften this as best I can. I'll speak it with grace and with love, but I will speak what he has given me to say. And so pride is unaware. It seems that the Pharisee was unaware that he was, in fact, as it was said, uh, Matthew 23, 25, and 7, and I don't, I did not give that scripture. Um, I like how this scripture puts it. It says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Verse 27, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. I like how he repeated that. (laughs) You know, whenever Jesus starts repeating himself, I feel like you're in trouble at that point. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you are outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And what I learned about the Pharisees while studying uh, through this, there's still much for me to learn, is that they were more concerned about appearing right than being right. I want to look the part. I want to look like a good Christian. I want to look like a good believer. I want to look like I'm following God's laws, his commands, uh, what he would ask of me. But on the inside, my heart is wretched, ugly and undone, as one pastor once said it. And so uh, for another one, I have pride is unapologetic. And the third one I have is pride is uncompromising. And I kind of want to sit on these two because as I wrestled with them, uh, I kind of figured out that they were almost one and the same and that these two kind of go hand in hand when it comes to the breaking down of personal relationships, and not only personal relationships, but our relationships um, with God. Unapologetic means not acknowledging or expressing regret. Uncompromising means showing an unwillingness to make concession to others, especially by changing one's way or opinions. And so we heard last week, TJ said, uh, sin is a relationship killer. 
And it's been told and I have read that one of the biggest detriments to any successful relationship, be it yours with God, marriage, or friends, is an unapologetic and uncompromising heart. Um, I'll give you an example, and this is probably personal. Melissa gets upset when I give personal examples. She says, why are you always telling your business? I was like, well, yeah, I was like, (laughs) exactly, I can't tell anybody else's. And I never, and I didn't really perfect the art of lying very well. So um, I had a friend. He's my best friend till this day. Uh, It was my sophomore year in college. And this is where it gets personal. Uh, His favorite quote was, ain't nothing but sin after 10. Um, Well, it was about 10, 30, 11 o'clock on a Friday. Um, I had gotten a phone call. Uh, My wife likes to believe I didn't have a life before her. And I tell her, I was like, I can assure you, there was a life before you and I. If I could scrub it out, I would. But unfortunately, it's, I'm going to have to give an account for that later. So I got a, I got a phone call. Do you know what a phone call is 1030 on a Friday? Uh, so my friend who was staying with me at the time, he knew what that call meant. And he said to me, are you sure you should go over there tonight? He's like, I noticed you're packing a bag and there are no church clothes in that bag. (laughs) I looked at him and I said, I know what I'm doing. I'm okay. And there was some other things said after that. And I left. I returned that Sunday. He moved out that Monday. And he and I didn't talk for almost two and a half months. Because I didn't like what he had to say. I didn't like that he was doing what God has asked him to do, to try to keep me from stumbling over myself. But that's one of the dangers of pride is that I was unwilling and and, and unyielding to what God had given him to tell me. And that is how it gets destructive in relationships. I know a lot of us have seen divorce or heard of parents splitting up, or friends breaking up, or relationships falling apart, and we wonder, how did it happen? They were in such a good place. Weren't you guys friends for like 15 years? What happened? The answer to all of that is pride, pride, pride. You can say whatever you want. You can put whatever label, whatever specific deed they did or did not confess to or whatever happens. Like at the end of the day, the the reason relationships fall apart is because somebody is unwilling to admit that they had a part to play in what went wrong. Um, I'm three years married now. And I know that, yeah, hey, hey that's, a, that's a big one. That's a big one. Those, those of you who have really met me or have had conversations with me, no, no. If there's one, th- there are, there are there actually, there's a lot of things I'm guilty of. Honestly, I'm, 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 the, I'm on the most wanted poster in our living room. Um, but those of you who know me know that I'm very uh, firm in my stance about things, be it right or wrong. Um, And, you know, we can go down the list of excuses as to why that is. But, you know, me being hurt and me having, you know, less than pleasant past experiences does not permit me to behave in any way, shape or form. It's not an excuse for me to continue down a direct course. Because when I got married, I was told I was to lay down my life, sacrifice, submit to God. We, those of us who are married all know what we are told, and God expects us to follow those things unwavering as hard as it may be. I'm not saying it's hard, but, you know, every now and again my head gets in the way. I have to pull myself uh, back. It's, it's funny. We had a situation uh, this week. Melissa called me. And I was in the middle of wrestling with pride. You know, that's one thing. When you start studying God's word, you have to speak about it. It's like all those issues come up that week. So, you know, it's like you. So it's almost like, you know, you were good. You know, you thought you had put a handle on something. And then I was going to say, I feel bad who has to talk about sloth. But I have to talk about sloth. 
So I hope I get everything done that week. Um, but whoever has to talk about greed, I feel for you. I feel for you. Um, she called me, uh, I believe it was Wednesday or Thursday, and she said, hey, I've got bad news. And I'm like, oh, gosh, not right now, not right now. And she said, uh, I don't know how to say this properly. Uh, ooh, there's a way to say it. Your arch nemesis is coming to visit the house today. They, they um, and I just kind of said, huh. I was like, all right. I was like, that's, that's fine. That is fine. That's okay with me. And she looked, well, she looked at me. She kind of went, Wow. That was not uh, what, I, what I was expecting to hear from you. And I was like, no, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Little did she know I was in the middle of being dealt with. So I couldn't react as I normally would have. It was one of those, are you going to humble yourself right now? Oh, and it was a rough one. It was a rough one. But I, uh, by God's power, I did it. I did it. She had to rein me in after the visit just once. It was just once. She gave me congratulations. She said, you did good this time. Thank you, baby. Thank you. <laughs> and so, uh, not to make light of it, uh, but it's just one of those demonstrations like how pride so easily can creep into our life, the many forms that it takes. And what I have found is that why it's so hard to deal with is that when pride creeps up in our life, it takes form of something that is inoffensive to us. It caters to our ego, yeah. caters to our wants. Our convictions, our resolve, like I said, be they wrong or not, pride is great at singing the perfect lullaby to us. Um, it's almost like uh, Greek mythology, they had sirens, and sirens had a way of singing uh, ships ashore, and the sailors would dash themselves just because of the sweet song, not even aware, like they were, and I'd imagine it's like, you know you're going towards the rocks, right? You know you're headed towards destruction, correct? But because of the song and its allure and its appeal, you proceeded forward anyway. Um, let me get back on track. I'm not saying I fell off. But it said, I said, pride is unapologetic and uncompromising, showing an unwillingness to make concession to others, especially by changing one's way or opinions. And that's a tough place to be. We're going to go back uh, to the Pharisee when he calls out the, can you imagine? He calls out the tax collector in the middle of his prayer. He says, I'm not like that tax collector. And like I said, he did a whole lot of speaking about what he wasn't. But I'd imagine if God came down to him that day and said, well, now that we've covered what you're not, let's talk about what you are. And at that moment, I'd imagine his pride would be uncompromising, unwilling to change what is revealed to him in that moment. And that's what makes it so destructive. That's what makes it so bad for our walk with the Lord is that this is a can you say evolutionary walk up here? Because I feel like we're constantly in pursuit of change. I feel like all of us come here because we're in pursuit of real change. And change is fun. No, it's not. Change is okay <laughs> when it comes to shifting things that we know we need to shift. Like, oh, hey, I know I probably shouldn't eat as much of this. I probably shouldn't do as much of this. But when it comes to changing the things that we have so attached ourselves to, that's where it gets challenging, and that's where humility needs to, that's when you need to allow humility to come in and do its work. And so we're going to move on down. Uh, Max, Luke, I don't know how to say his name, it said Max Lusado had a quote, and it said, God resists the proud because the proud resist God. Arrogance will not admit to sin, the heart of pride never confesses, never repents, never asks for forgiveness. Pride is the hidden reef that shipwrecks the soul. And so for any of us who still may be confused or wondering if this is a sin that we struggle with, I got a few questions I'd like to ask you and me. 
I don't want you guys to think that it's just y'all who have an issue with pride. <laughs> uh, first one is, how good are you at receiving criticism? Criticism's a, a, a major part of getting through this life. And I feel like a lot of times, you know, I, I'd love to get inside the head of a, a therapist just to ask him. It's like, so when you propose these questions and you see these clients, what is the rate of change if you could put a number on it that you see? And if you see no change, why? Why is it they are still seeing you for the same thing? Why is it I'm having to come and see you again? Another question is, how do you respond when your spouse files a formal complaint against you? And I know pride is, is a tough one. Uh, whenever your spouse, a partner, a friend, whoever, ask you a question, basically ask you to, as the great prophet Ice Cube said, chiggity, check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> how do you respond when they come to you and they say, hey, we need to talk about something that you're doing that I find offense to. Do you jump to justify what you're doing? Or do you submit and open your ears to listen? Um, because what I have found is, and what, I was and what I've learned, is that pride is good for nothing but isolation. You live long enough and you are unyielding long enough. You will find yourself by yourself. And as I can imagine, I don't think there's anyone in this world, no matter how much they may fight it, ever wants to be alone. Third question. This one's a, this one's a doozy. This one may hurt. Strap up. How good are you at accepting responsibility for your actions? Where are you with accountability? Can you identify the areas that you need to change? And I find that was one of the hardest things uh, to wrestle with, is to learn to take accountability for your actions. Take res accept responsibility. Don't make excuses for the things that you're doing, because as it's been said before, most people know when you're about to do something you ain't got no business doing. And that was, that, that was a hard ouch for me. Um, as you guys have heard me say, uh, I struggled with uh, fear a lot. And I would, have, uh, I, would, I would have counseling sessions. I would talk to people, you know, and they would ask me, what's stopping you from doing this or doing that? What's stopping you from pursuing this or pursuing that? And for whatever reason, for whatever reason, it never quite occurred to me how fearful I was of things you know, the actual condition of it. I can never put a name on it. I get asked outright, what's stopping you? Well, you know, what's keeping you from doing it? And it, it never occurred to me until a drive up to church one day. And that's when the, 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 the scripture and the truths I'll set you free finally had some definition added to it. And it's when I learned that, Lord, I lack the courage to pursue these things. And I was wondering why that scripture never really, really hit the way it did. And it's because I was avoiding the truth of it all. My pride would not let me admit that I was, in fact, despite all my screaming and hollering and, you know, howling and, you know, the gnashing of my teeth, is that I was, in fact, uh, scared. And it's when we can come down low enough to admit where we are that we invite God to come in. It's like, we are so convinced that the door is found up here, you know, through me helping myself, me lifting myself up. This is where I'll meet God. I'll meet God up here when really you meet him down here. And the last question I have is, when was the last time you thought perhaps I need to change? You know, because pride is convinced that it's everyone else that needs to change, that it's everyone else's problem. Pride says, I'm right, you're wrong. Now, who in here likes being wrong? Well, I, no, matter of fact, who in here is always right? <laughs> Thank, I appreciate all of you being honest. I was going to say, don't get shy in here now. If you're always right, stand by that. Be right. even if you, And it, it's, it's a hard place to be. Uh, 
One thing I can't stand, I told Melissa when we got married, I was like, one thing I won't ever do is I won't argue with the truth. I told her that. And I said that under the, you know, because I convinced myself, I was like, I'm going to find a way around that loophole. I was like, she's not going to get me. (laughs) But she found her loophole. She knows how to catch me off guard. I have a rule at home that's called read the room. It's basically assess the situation before you come in and speak or say or do anything. (laughs) Melissa has decided that that's the best time to come and talk to me. (laughs) And she'll come in there. She got me three weeks ago. She hit me hard and fast with some real facts, and I couldn't say anything. It's like she just asked these questions, said what she had to say, and went to bed and left me to ponder on it. (laughs) And I was like, so you're going to leave me at... At 12.30 with this on a Saturday. I was like, this is, this is me time. You came and you obstructed me time to drop some cold, hard facts. And I couldn't do nothing but be quiet because, like I said, I said, I'd never argue with the truth. And she hit me with it hard. I don't think I slept well that night. You can imagine. I, I, I went and got into bed, and I was afraid to wake her up. I was like, I don't want to say nothing else. So, <laughs> I don't, I, don't want her to wake, I, don't want to, I don't want her to wake up out of a sleep with something else to say to me. <laughs> and another thing. No, 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 no. Just stay asleep. Stay asleep. It's like, okay. So we've covered pride. Is everybody okay? I hope. Are we all right? Everybody doing well this morning? Okay. Because one of the things that we discussed when we started talking about this sermon series is like we don't want to, you know, give you so much of this up front without providing relief on the back end. We don't want you to come up and say, hey, I have an eating problem. And we say, well, you're greedy. See you later. (laughs) We wanted to provide some relief. And so now that is when we get down uh, to the tax collector, the IRS. But the tax collector stood at a distance. I like how when the tax collector came in, it's almost like he took a few steps forward into the church. And then for whatever reason, he was like, I don't, I felt like he was telling himself, I shouldn't be in here because I know who and, and what I am. I know what I do on a daily basis. It's like he had that instant remorse in his heart because he was aware. He said, but the tax collector stood at a distance, dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. He couldn't bear the thought of looking the Lord in the face. But instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. Confession. That's good, honest, raw confession right there. That's a a humble man, and we should all strive for that. And I wanted to draw a little parallel here. It's like we go back to the Pharisee. I am not. I am not. I am not. I am not. Tax collector said one thing, I am. And it was the most honest thing said in that scripture. It was a realization of his lack. He acknowledged who he was and what he did not have. And it goes on to say, I tell you, this sinner, the man who was honest about where he was, went home justified before God. It's funny that the Pharisee went in there and, you know, pumped himself up, went home with nothing because at that point he had just proclaimed, I'm self-sufficient. There's nothing I need from you, God. I am this, I am that. I am this, I am that. And the danger with self-sufficiency is that, like I said earlier, you put yourself in direct opposition to God. You make yourself unable to receive all that he has for you. You limit yourself. And so for me, I I, I thought this, and I'm sure one or two people have felt the same way. Okay, God, you've got my house surrounded. You've called me out. I'm prideful. I'm prideful. I'm prideful. I struggle with it. What are my next steps? What do I do next? How do I begin this process of understanding humility? How do I act it out? And Colossians 3 and 12 says, clothe yourselves therefore as God's own chosen ones, his own picked representatives, 
purified and holy and well-beloved by God himself by putting on tender-hearted pity and mercy, kind feeling, a lowly opinion of yourself, gentle ways, patience, which is long-suffering. God gives us the perfect recipe for it. You go low and you accept your limitations. And what and when I when I when I re- wrote that, I was reading something. Uh, you know, C.S. Lewis was a big influence when it came to a, a lot of the things throughout the Christian faith. He was probably one of the more imaginative writers. Um, basically, I condensed it, and he said, "Take proper inventory of yourself. You know, don't think of yourself so high. Don't think of yourself." super low, but take a correct inventory of who you are, what you lack, what you need. Acknowledge your dependence on God. And that's the worst part about a prideful heart. A prideful heart is, is convinced, ignorant of its need for a savior. And so I have right here, you know, how do we go low? What does that look like? It means confessing a few things to yourself. One, I don't know everything. Everything is not all right. I do need help. And while yes, many or some may have offended me, I myself am not without blemish or blame. And that was a, that's a, that's, that's a tough one for anyone uh, to admit. And I guess now I'm coming to a close. I want to make sure I give you everything the Lord has given me, but I feel like he's telling me uh, to wrap up. And in wrapping up, I'll close with this. It says, pride is short of nothing of a thief in the night. The enemy disguised as an assistant. It will rob you of the gift. It will rob of the gift, power, love, and grace of God's presence, power, and abilities. Pride does not help any of us. It holds us back, keeps us from what could be the transformative power of God's touch and spirit in his kingdom. And so I'm done. The musicians can come. Um, You know, uh, last time I was up here, I I went back and I rewatched the tape and I learned that it's like, you know, I'm not very good at, uh, at closing. I don't know how to close anything off. You know, and I, and I find that I'm like that at home when, I, when Melissa and I are, are talking. We'll have a conversation, and I'll just kind of walk out of the room. Not rude or anything. I've just, I, I, I'm, I'm done. And she's like, well, are we finished talking? I was like, oh, yeah, I thought we were, we were done. She's like, well, you didn't really give me any closing statements. I was like, oh, well, yeah, I'm done. I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't have anything. We're done. We're done. adjourned. <laughs> Um, and so I'll say one last thing, and then I'll ask, uh, I don't know who's coming up to do the call to, is it called to benediction? Um, you know, one of the things I think about a lot when we, when we do this, and we start asking people to come uh, up to the altar for prayer, um, I feel it because I know that there are people out there who still need help. There are people in here who still need help. And I know the greatest setback that we face during the call to benediction is for whatever reason, we are afraid to come up here and admit, Lord, I need prayer. Because as I said, everything is not all right. I am fighting. I am struggling. And I can't seem to find my way out. Well, your way out is up here. So stop going home carrying that. Stop avoiding the presence that you so desperately need up here. And I just want to drive that point home. It's like if you are in here right now and you are wrestling or if you're fighting or if you have a need, don't be afraid to come to the altar because you're not going to find help anywhere else. It's not available anywhere else. Yeah, we got doctors. We got psychologists. I was like, but the true healing starts here through confession and the acceptance of God's power and his ability to move and work in your life. So I'm closing. Everybody, you can stand. And, I'm, <laughs> and, since, and, since, and since I don't know how to close, I'm going to turn it over to whoever's coming up after me. <laughs> he said, if, um, 
If God has been speaking to you today, if he's been working on you today, then we invite you to come to the altar, to come uh, pray with someone, to, to spend time with God, and to maybe take the next step to releasing pride in your life. So as we worship, reflect on that, and, and if you feel led to come forward, we'd love to pray with you. There's nothing worth more that can ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone by your presence Lord. Holy Spirit you are well
Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you for all of the work that you've done here t- this morning. Pray that you would continue to do that. You would work in our lives, that we might know you, that we might be drawn closer into your presence. It's in Jesus' name we pray, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, If you all uh, could, you can have a seat for a second. I just want to let you know about a a few things going on in the life of our church before we go. Uh, So we uh, at Cross Church, we uh, love our groups ministry. We think that this is a great way for us to connect uh, as a church and to grow together. And so if you would like to be part of a group, we've just started our summer session this week. So it's not too late. We've got some groups that are even starting up this this coming week. So uh, you can find me or you can sign up online and we'd love to get you connected in a group. Uh, In addition to that, we have uh, this week our Belong class. So we offer two. We offer an in-person one after service. That's today. So if you're here and you want to know more about what Cross Church is like, want to know more about what it means to be connected to and involved at our church, you can uh, grab me. We'll be on the other side in the conference room. Or we also have a Zoom option. So just let me know. That will be on Thursday. Our Zoom um, Belong class will be then. So uh, thank you guys, uh, and, and I want to remind us as well that we are a giving church. I almost forgot. Uh, so uh, we're so uh, excited about that, about the opportunity to worship God through giving. We know that he has always given us more than we could ever give back to him, and so we respond to him in generosity. At Cross Church, you can give in a few ways. You can give online, uh, text to give, cash app, or if you're here, we have a box to my left and my right. Uh, Before we go, PV wants to come and give a little bit of an update about what's going on with the renovation, so I'm going to invite him up now. Hey, man, give Damarin a great big hand for that message this morning. TJ and Damarin knocking it out of the park, and I appreciate both of them for giving me a little opportunity to take a break. But uh, just quickly before we go, um, again, we started uh, the renovations uh, next door, so they've already uh, begun the process of uh, gutting out the space. And so this week, um, when you come back next Sunday, you'll probably notice some things that will be different um, because they will begin to open up uh, our existing space into the space uh, next door. And there's some things that will happen in here as a modification as well. But we're excited about that. Amen. And uh, we're excited uh, for what God is doing. And, uh, and we're excited about that project. One other thing. Um, as you can imagine as well, uh, when we make that transition, we need more chairs, amen? Um, not only for over there, but, but we're going to take all the chairs out of here, and so there won't be many chairs in here for the kids as well. Um, so and we're in the process of uh, actually purchasing uh, some chairs, and uh, so anyone uh, wants to give to that uh, specifically, I just need $750. Now, here I'll tell you that this is a big deal. If you know anything about these chairs, these chairs are really expensive, but I actually found somebody that's uh, wanting to give us 300 chairs, way more than we need, for $750. Now, 300 chairs like these would cost probably about $10,000. So so uh, all I need is $750. So if you want to contribute to that, give to that, hey, just uh, go through any of our giving options and uh, put a comment in there and just say chairs or or something like that. We would appreciate that. But we're getting them uh, uh, in a couple weeks, and so we are so excited uh, for what God is getting ready to do. But want to give you that brief the update. And so thank you guys for your prayers, for your faithfulness. Be watching social media. We'll have uh, pictures posted as, as the process uh, goes along. So just wanted you to know why the, the foyer looks a little bare because we got to get everything out of there because they're going to start tearing down walls. So um, we're excited about that. Anything else, TJ? We're good? Oh, th- Ju- July 4th, just put it in your calendar after service. Uh, that actually is a Sunday, if you didn't know that. July 4th of July is on a Sunday. So after service, we're, we're going to have a family cookout. Um, so just put that on your calendar. We'll be posting some stuff online as well. Um, so whatever your famous 4th of July recipe that you do, bring that on, on that Sunday, man. We, we, we want it. We want all the famous stuff, all the good stuff. So we're excited about that. And there's several other things that are coming up uh, as well. And we'll be sharing those over the next couple of weeks. So, uh, I guess I'm closing out. All right. Well, thank you guys for being here. Thank you. First time guests. Give our first time guests a great big hand. Amen. Thank you guys for worshiping with us. 
any questions, anything you want to know about Cross Church, see me, see TJ, uh, see anyone that's here, they can tell you about it. But as you go today, you know what you're going to have to, what you're going to work on, right? You also know what you're going to be challenged with this week, right? So probably, probably within the next hour, you're going to have a pride ch challenge, right? So, uh, so let's uh, pr let's pray for humility and let's remember this: that that when we when we allow ourselves to go down, God says He will exalt us. We don't have to exalt ourselves. God will do that for us. So, uh, as you leave here today, be blessed and uh, and know that God loves you, and we love you here at Cross Church. But Cross Church is a church that loves God and loves people. Have a great rest of your Sunday.